Um, it's Pat Churchland. Rama, I wonder if you could say a little bit about the uh, transcranial stimulation studies of temporal lobe on normal subjects and the feelings that that produces. Yeah. Um, I ha haven't, I'm afraid I haven't looked at the evidence very carefully, and I've known people who have been in this gizmo, and, and the results are ambiguous. Uh, as you know, there was a recent study from, I think it was from UCLA, showing that if you stimulate different parts of the parietal lobes, you get out-of-the-body experiences, either the sense of uh, you being up there in the ceiling and watching your own body like a disembodied soul, watching your own body, or sometimes, and I've seen these patients with right parietal lobe disturbance, who feel that they're here, but they feel another presence of something which they can't describe. Um, and sometimes they interpret it as a supernatural thing behind them, watching them. So either they get disembodied, watch their own bodies, or they're here. And some, so all of these paradoxes arise because you construct your body image in your parietal lobe. You get all these interesting paradoxes. And it's easy to misinterpret that as some sort of religious experience or God is looking at me from the shoulder or I'm looking at my, my soul is up there in the ceiling looking at me and that sort of thing. And you can probably get that with transcranial magnetic stimulation, although the results have been extremely variable. And I think actually Richard was... And a subject in this, maybe you could illuminate. Richard, Richard had a question as well, I think, and then Harry, Cr Harry Croto. I was a subject in, in Michael Persinger's um, apparatus. I'm afraid I was a failure. It did absolutely nothing for me at all. Um, I'm apparently not, um, to, to my great regret, I was, I was not um, susceptible to any kind of mystical oneness with the universe. <laughs> You had a question uh, earlier as we answered that. Okay, so, uh, uh, Harry. Yeah, I, I have a, a, com, a, 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 a statement, Harry Crodo. I actually interviewed um, Charlie Towns, a person for whom I have great admiration as a scientist, probably the best, one of the great physics Nobel Prizes of the century, of last century. And I questioned him about, um, I, I've interviewed quite a lot of Nobel Prize winners and we've discussed religious issues. And it's quite interesting. I said, how does he respond to the question that Einstein was posed to Eisen was, uh, do you believe in God? And he said, I believe in the God of Spinoza, who reveals himself through the harmony of what exists, not in a God who concerns himself with the fates oh, and uh, actions of uh, human oh, beings. No. And he said, during the interview at least, that he felt somewhat, he was somewhere at that point. And that's a very different sort of God. I think it's an interesting point to take. I did, however, I must admit, send an email uh, not that long ago to Charlie to for, uh, push it that little bit further because I, I felt um, it was an interesting point. Because here was someone who, as far as I'm concerned, was able to have a schizophrenic attitude in one case, a fantastic development of the maser and the laser. Uh, also, um, in my own area of microwave spectroscopy, writing a fantastic book was unbelievable rational analysis and yet something so far apart from me um, with regard to religion, and he said he, but he was somewhat equivocal at the second stage. But uh, I felt that in discussion he had a problem, the problem that we, many uh, religious people who are scientists have. And so it's not as cut and dried. And of course, many of you will know that uh, Charlie Towns uh, won the, Pen the Templeton Prize um, last year. I mean, this year it was Barrow, but uh, I think it's it's interesting that certainly this arguably the greatest trophy of the Templeton Prize, had a little bit of problem when I questioned him uh, how he uh, sort of saw uh, Einstein's somewhat deistic attitude of religion. Thank you. Paul? When did Philip? So I was wondering if um, the temporal epilepsy patients were also showing abnormal activity when forced with ethical choices, for example. And generally, what the discussion we're having today tells us about um, ethics rather than just religion. That's a very good question. I think Pat might have some ideas about this. But the general question is what, you know, people might think I'm being very neuroreductionist and, and, and uh, this might eliminate human values. Far from that. Um, in fact, so there's a recent discovery, which I'll tell you about, which we have been studying, but originally discovered by Giacomo Rizzolatti. These are groups of neurons, which are called mirror neurons. Some of you may already know about this. If you record from the front of the brain, from the frontal lobes, there's a group of neurons which will fire 
when the monkey or indeed the human being reaches for a cup, reaches for a peanut, pulls a lever, pushes something, different neurons for different actions, semi-skilled actions. This has been known for 20 or 30 years from Vernon Mountcastle. But what people have now found is there's a group of ne these neurons, a subset of them, will fire not only when the monkey reaches for a peanut, but when the monkey watches another monkey reach for a peanut. So it's as though it's, people call it monkey see, monkey do neurons. And what's interesting about them is it's as though they're putting themselves in the other monkey's shoes, doing a sort of a virtual reality simulation in their brains. And that's why they're called mirror neurons. And the relevance to, the, to your question is now people have found in humans if you record from the anterior cingulate, it's been known for a long time, if you record from the anterior cingulate, if you poke somebody with a needle, the neuron will fire. So people used to say it's a pain center and there's a pain neuron. But in fact, many of these neurons will, will fire when you poke somebody else with a new needle. So it's sort of like an empathy neuron. And what's amazing about this is this neuron uh, is actually dissolving the barrier between you and other people, between self and others, not in some metaphorical sense. If you look at Eastern mystical traditions, they talk about dissolving barriers and becoming one with other people, but literally dissolving the barrier because those neurons simply don't know the difference between poking you and poking the person. Okay? So in fact, it provides a basis, almost a neural basis, for ethics. And I don't want to commit the fal naturalistic fallacy here, but it provides a neural basis for ethics, a strong neural basis for ethics. I like to call them Dalai Lama neurons. After you through. Okay. Beth. Uh, Elizabeth Loftus. Now, why would you assume that that's an empathy neuron when maybe what these people are doing is just imagining it happening to them? And but it's a see, selfish thing. Yeah. Th there is a circularity there. What I'm arguing is that the neurons, the whole notion of you and other, you know, in other words, even self, okay, your notion of yourself emerges from, partly from the activity of these neurons because part of what you regard as yourself is looking at yourself as a social being, as other people look at you. And partly it's these neurons that allow you to do that, to look at your own self from the point of view of another person. So there's a little bit of circularity in your question. And in fact, recently we've shown autistic children, some autistic children, many of them, lack mirror neurons. They have mirror neuron dysfunction, which is one reason they lack empathy and lack a theory of other minds and are, are unable to put themselves in your shoes to look at the world from your point of view. Carolyn? Um, it's not been studied. It's a very reasonable hypothesis that they also have some dysfunction in, in, in the mirror neuron system. By the way, there's now a mirror neuron mania. We've got, we've got to be careful not to attribute everything to mirror neurons. But I do think they're doing some very important things and may help answer some of the most enigmatic aspects, elusive aspects of human nature, which have proved very difficult to uh, tackle. Yeah. Um, oh, hi, Rama. Uh, Joan Roughgarden here. We were on a panel yes. together yesterday. And... Um, now, I personally find these facts very interesting, but I am puzzled, frankly, as to why you think they're important or relevant uh, to the issue at hand about, uh, uh, say, theology or um, the connection with uh, uh, the compatibility of uh, religion and science. And there are two points that, that I would like you to address, if you might. The first is, of course, that for any mental state, there will be a corresponding physical state. And so there would undoubtedly be a brain state before and after eating chocolate, before or after eating um, uh, any, anything else, uh, anchovies, or yep. before or after seeing a movie. And so one interpretation of your uh, findings is that you simply have very accurate gadgets which detect the brain state corresponding to a certain suite of mental states, namely those associated with... Now, there would also be, with some other gadgets, presumably mental states corresponding to a scientific experience, like yeah. that moment of really great linear thinking where you come, come up with an answer or something. So that's the first thing, is why aren't there just simply zillions of different mental states and you just simply have a bunch of them right now and, and that it's just an interesting curiosity that you found these. Now, the second point with Do you want respect to, have, to a... Have you answer the first one first? Yeah, let me answer the first one first. Oh, okay. Um, the second well, one's derived. You see, it's true that for every, you know, thing you see or perceive or think, there's some corresponding brain state. Yeah. But that's precisely what I'm interested in. As a neuroscientist, I want to know which. It's not merely that there is a brain state. Everybody knows that. 
but which particular areas of the brain are involved, what is the circuitry involved, how did it evolve, what is the biology. It's the same as any other biological system. When you consume food, obviously it comes out and you absorb nutrients. You could say, well, why, why do you need to know how it's done? I want to know how fats are absorbed, I want to know how glucose is absorbed, what enzymes are involved, what part of the liver is involved. These are fascinating, detailed questions we would like to address. Okay. Now, regarding the other question, does this in any way negate a, a, a sort of very abstract conception of a god, the Spinoza god, or what we call Brahman in Hindu philosophy? I would say, no, it doesn't negate that. That also answers uh, Chuck Harper's question. And, and in fact, you could say that sense of awe that many of us scientists have about the very existence of the cosmos, human existence, all of that, if you want to call that God, I mean, I, I would go along with that. So in a sense, what I'm talking about is religious experience, parts of the brain involved, but it's different from, it's sort of not correct to compare it with saying chocolate, right? Because I am interested in what happens when you eat chocolate, there are, uh -huh. but there's different centers in the brain. Uh -huh. and they're called centers concerned with appetite, with regulation of body weight, and why chocolate rather than something else? These are all scientific, biological questions, and equally legitimate, why do you have religious experiences? Yeah, well then, uh, the follow-on to that, it w it, which is the second question, which is presumably there are different parts of the brain in which uh, one does have a scientific experience, and you've not shown that there is any physical incompatibility between the parts of the brain that turn on when you have a, a religious experience from a part of the brain which would turn on if you had a scientific experience, so to speak. And so at a very even your own data would be consistent with the compatibility of science, of a scientific experience along with a religious experience. Well, again, it, it harks back to whether you're talking about religious experience in a, in a very abstract mystical sense of, you know, some cosmic god versus supposing I see an angel or I see, I don't want to mention a particular god for fear of offending people, but a particular god right in front of me. If I see a glass there, and I can go find a neural basis for that, and I explain how you see it on all of that. But if I say I'm seeing an angel, I can prove by independent physical means and measurements there is no other thing there. There's only your brain activity, right? So in one case, you can make a correlation and a systematic lawful correlation between the events in the external world, which are ind independently measurable, and measurable brain events. In the second case, there is nothing in the world that is independently measurable which you're correlating with your brain events. That's the key difference between a hallucination and a delusion on the one hand and the real correlate of a real object being perceived by the brain on the other hand. But again, let me say this doesn't negate the value of a religious experience to the person who's experiencing it or the notion of some cosmic god which is not somebody watching me and punishing me. So maybe there is that sort of... Now, Bill Hilbert has a question, but I should be, let me just interject one thing, which is there was a, an experiment done uh, about a year ago by Naomi Eisenberger and Matt Lieberman at UCLA, in which they had somebody in an fMRI scanner, and they were involved, they, they thought they were a part of a group of people playing uh, a game. And you could, you could see in the scanner, you could see an object being thrown to what you were told were other players in the game. And... At one point, at some point during the game, the person in the scanner was actually excluded from being able to play the game. So they suddenly found themselves watching other people playing a game, throwing a ball, computer ball. And at that point, the, the person's, according to the fMRI scan anyway, the person's brain started registering um, in, in what would be called pain areas. In other words, the, the areas that they, that they, in which they would have, would have lit up when they were experiencing actual physical pain um, was, were activated because of this moment of ostracism, or if you want to call it shunning. So uh, there are, I think these techniques can be extraordinarily valuable in, 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 in beginning to learn about what's going on in some of these situations where, uh, where these social situations that um, uh, involve um, hostilities and shunning and so on. Bill, can I get this to you? 